coming of age, uh, I was in college during 9-11, and my entire professional life has been, uh, in the humanitarian sector at least, has been framed in this context of a global war on terror, a battle against terrorism, um, a fight against extremism, whatever the narrative has, it has been, um, we've been living in a world defined by a struggle against terror, or I have been, uh, for my entire professional life. And only in the last few years have we started to see narrative shifts. Um, the big issues are climate change, now we talk about strategic competition, great power confrontation. And yet, as we take on all these new burdens and challenges that the humanitarian community has to navigate, um, the terrorism piece never went away. So it's still there and it still remains a major challenge for humanitarian actors. Both the acts of terrorism themselves and the impact that has on civilian populations around the world, uh, the kinetic actions taken by militaries, either Western or domestic, against terrorists uh, or insurgents or armed groups in their own countries. But for the humanitarian community, and especially those that are based in Washington or Europe, the impact of the counterterrorism regulations that states have put into place to help reduce the amount of resources, financial and otherwise, going to groups designated as terrorism has remained an extremely onerous and difficult challenge to navigate, both the legal uh, compliance issues, the fiscal issues it entails, but even just the pure operational access challenges um, that, the, that navigating these regulations um, entails. And so we're, we're very grateful we have a real um, expert panel here today of colleagues to help us unpack some of the issues today, um, especially in the context of what we're seeing is incremental but meaningful changes. So joining us from New York, um, I'll start with the folks online. We have Professor Naz Modirzadeh, um, a professor of practice at the Harvard Law School. Um, as long as I've worked on this issue, um, her writings and her emails and, and the testimonies that she's done have been really instrumental for my understanding of, of this issue set. We also have uh, Aurelien Beaufle from UN OCHA. Um, Aurelien is the uh, Chief Policy Advice in the Planning Section at the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And next to me on stage here we have uh, Rachel Alpert, a partner at Jenner & Block, who's also done, um, has a long uh, experience working in the U.S. government and continues to write on sanctions and, and the impact of sanctions on humanitarian action. And finally, um, Hashem Khadrawi, the head of operations for Geneva Call. Um, uh, Hashem is the director of operations uh, for Geneva Call, and I'll let him um, explain a little bit about what Geneva Call does and why this issue is um, salient for them. So we'll start here on stage with you, um, Hashem. Uh, Geneva Call's MO and, and purpose for being is to engage these non-state armed groups in a dialogue in order to improve their compliance with international humanitarian law, IHL. Um, this includes issues around access denial. Um, these groups are often designated by the United States, the European Union, the UN, and others as terrorists, and, and that creates um, logistical and operational challenges for these kinds of dialogues. Can you share with us a little bit um, the challenges that Geneva Call faces um, when choosing to open up a dialogue with these kinds of groups um, with respect to your own legal and operational safety. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me well on the microphone. Hi to Naz and Aurelien, it's a pity that we don't meet. I come from Geneva, but uh, <laughs> I have, but I hope next time we can meet in New York. So thanks a lot, really much, Jacob, uh, really for, for this question. Thank you as well for NRC and CSIS to organize this event. Um, Maybe briefly, I will just explain in few words what we do. I think it's not maybe uh, familiar with, with everyone. So our work mainly is to engage directly with armed groups in conflict zones uh, to try to secure behavior change, uh, concrete behavior change on the ground that benefits civilian populations. And this behavior change could be, uh, uh, for example, uh, to release child soldiers, uh, to vacate, uh, hospitals or civilian uh, uh, buildings to not attack or loot uh, trucks um, or um, let's say any other humanitarian assistance uh, uh, areas and as well try to secure and preserve 
humanitarian uh, space. So we try to negotiate with them directly so they understand the, the importance of as well um, um, preserving humanitarian space and not attacking humanitarian workers. So we have this direct engagement with them on a daily basis. In 18 countries worldwide, we work with uh, more than 150 armed groups from all over the world. And this direct engagement, of course, is, um, uh, causes challenges, both, of course, on the security side, legally and operationally. And uh, so we have the teams on the ground, of course, that are doing that. Myself, as well, I'm being visiting a lot um, I don't know, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and Syria, Yemen, the Sahel, trying to talk and engage them directly. So we talk at the leadership level, uh, but as well as well at, the, at the field commander's level. So, of course, city measures uh, have an impact. This is clear. But I, will have, I would like to distinguish between um, the local city measures, so the local designations by the governments, uh, by the host governments, and what we have today, the designations by uh, uh, regional actors or global bodies, such as you know, the, the, the US, the UN, African Union, and uh, EU, and so on and so forth. So there is a difference because um, we, may, uh, we have the possibility to engage with, you know, with the US, with the EU, at Brussels, at New York level, trying to explain and push uh, two for exceptions, and sometimes you have these good examples that were shared earlier by, uh, by Jan. When it comes to discussing with local governments uh, that are in direct war, in direct conflicts with these armed groups, it's a much uh, different ballgame. Uh, because here they face directly the effects of uh, these armed groups, uh, let's say attacks or, wh or whatever, and they are not really, let's say, versed into the uh, intricacies of humanitarian uh, principles, they don't care, to be frank with you. So talking with the Malian government, Syrian government, and the other government about giving a space, it's not that easy, and, and it causes direct challenges. For us, the first challenge, for example, is the fact that we don't have the right, legally speaking, to talk to armed groups. Uh, an example, in Nigeria, so the Nigerian government uh, prohibits uh, by law to, uh, to discuss with uh, illegal armed, armed groups. Uh, and it's, we have the same situation in various other, other countries. So there is, you can be basically illegal and then subject to being arrested, being you know, sentenced or expelled um, if you engage directly with these, with these armed groups. Um, then you have the challenges when it comes to, uh, to the financing. Uh, and here I talk about the donor community that are usually coming, um, the same donors are the same ones that have these sanctions, uh, usually the Western world. And of course, if you, um, if you ask for money, they will ask uh, to do what with it? And you say, ah, but it's to speak with this armed group and this armed group, and they say, ah, no, not with this armed group, and why not this armed group? And then you start to debate and negotiate and have to explain to them the importance of talking to everyone. And sometimes we are not financed or not funded because of our very work. Um, and this causes issue on the ground because we help other organizations to, uh, for them to get access to areas. We facilitate with an access for UN and for other organizations. If we don't get funded, we can't negotiate, and then we don't have, I mean, organizations don't have access. And at the end, populations basically are not really being assisted. So there is a direct consequence as well, not only for us directly, but as well for, for the global international, let's say, humanitarian community. Um, so, this is from the state, host state, and regional perspective. I would like as well to speak about the armed groups perspective. I think it's very important. Uh, we engage with them a lot. We ask them as well, how do they see uh, these measures and these sanctions being imposed on them? Uh, do you, how, do, how do you feel being labeled uh, tomorrow morning as a, as a terrorist? So we distinguish three main, let's say, uh, reactions. Um, don't care, do care, and don't know. Usually they don't know, and it's, it's a bit unfortunate, but most of them have no clue, actually, that uh, we have a lot of people in New York and elsewhere being talking about uh, Group A or Group B. Um, so the don't care um, part of it, this is more the, uh, 
very extreme groups. Uh, they really don't care. They're not subject to any kind of international pressure. The ISIS types and, and others as well, not, not only ISIS, they don't care. You can label them the way they want, the way you want. For them, they will continue to, to act the way they want. So here's a very different way as well of interacting with them. The do care, this is pretty interesting because they are the ones that usually exert uh, control over a portion of a territory. Um, we call them de facto authorities. Uh, they control, you know, they have, you know, governance mechanisms, they have rules and regulations. They want to be seen basically as a solution to the state. Um, I don't know, the Kurdish groups, for example, uh, Somaliland, some groups in uh, Myanmar and so on. So here, there's a lot of leeway, of course, because their behavior, uh, basically, the, the, the way they behave, they see a direct consequence as well on the way they are labeled. So I think it's something that will be a uh, current and stick is pretty working well. The don't know type, the majority, they really don't know. Uh, and this is pretty interesting because they just need to know. And what we do directly at Jivakol is by training them, by bringing them, and I say really, and with in, in our hands the reports where their names are being uh, cited uh, because they do exactions. Here they realize that, okay, they, if they change, there will be a different uh, approach and they are part of a, let's say, globalized, uh, let's say, world. So I think it's, every group has a different uh, uh, approach of, of doing it. And I would just want to finish and give the floor to my, um, to my colleague here and to my, to my colleagues here to say that we are based in Geneva because today Geneva is the only place in the world uh, that is able to host and receive armed groups uh, numerous times to speak about humanitarian work. So last year we've been inviting dozens of armed groups. Uh, the Taliban's came, we had groups from Sahel, from Syria, so they come to us, we negotiate with them, they sign deeds of commitments with Geneva Call, and this is possible because uh, in Geneva there is no, let's say, applicability of the sanctions to the groups that come to speak about humanitarian uh, uh, issues. And I think this is very important because uh, Geneva as a town, uh, not even Switzerland as a country, but really Geneva as a town. And it's the only place that we know, and for me, it's, um, it shows as well the importance of having these, let's say, safe heavens uh, worldwide where we could discuss with these type of groups because this is the only way that we can you know, push forward agendas around humanitarian access, uh, peace, and stability. So, yes, I just wanted to, to finish yeah, by this thanks, point. Thanks for that. Um, and the importance of that safe space, both physically in, in Geneva, but also in the nature of the work that you're doing. So. You, Geneva Call is a very, is a relatively small and very hands-on and, and, and right in the thick of it organization. I want to turn now to Aurelien from a, a OCHA perspective and, and go up to kind of the systemic level. Can you talk to us a little bit about OCHA's role um, in identifying solutions to some of these major challenges, both for UN agencies and their partners? Um, what are the key gains that you've seen made and what are the challenges that you, or the hurdles that you see in the future? Yeah. Good morning, uh, Jacob. Good morning, everyone. And, and, and thanks a lot for inviting Ocha to this uh, CSIS and, 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 and NRC event. So, so to, to answer your questions, I mean, before getting into the solution part, the, the first role of Ocha is to build consensus about the fact that there is an issue. And I'm starting with this because still today, uh, some actors, uh, especially on the counter-terrorism side, but, but not only, are, are reluctant to acknowledge that there is an issue. And, and for that, OCHA's message has been pretty clear all along, and it's based on what we see uh, in the field, in uh, operations led by our partners, and what OCHA offices see in across emergencies. And, and I cannot articulate it this way. I mean, first, the fact is that today, counterterrorism legislation apply in most of the big humanitarian emergencies, whether it is Somalia, whether it is Palestine, whether it is Afghanistan, uh, the Great Lakes uh, region, uh, whether it is counterterrorism legislation taken by post government or counterterrorism legislation uh, and measures taken by the UN, uh, by donor states, uh, and so on. So counterterrorism is everywhere in humanitarian uh, operation. The second aspect to that 
is that uh, for humanitarian organizations and the way humanitarian organization works, uh, it is almost impossible for humanitarian organizations not to have contact with what are called terrorist groups and not to transfer resources to this group. Um, basic things, uh, humanitarian organizations need to pay utility bills to companies which are owned by listed individuals or controlled by, by listed armed groups. Uh, they need to implement programs with health ministries, uh, which might be controlled by uh, listed uh, entities. They need to provide medical care to wounded fighters uh, belonging to groups which might be terrorists. So really, there's this clash between counterterrorism and, and, and humanitarian action in most emergencies where we work. And this has very practical consequences and creates very practical risks. I mean, we see humanitarian organization and staff being... Uh, prosecuted or detained and harassed um, on, 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 on the argument that they're supporting terrorism just because they're doing their job. Uh, we see humanitarian organizations who suspend programs or are reluctant to engage in certain humanitarian programs because the fear of falling the fool of, of counterterrorism legislations. Uh, that's a chilling effect that has been described in many, uh, in many uh, articles. We see private actors such as banks, which support humanitarian operations that practice the risking, that refuse to process some of the transactions humanitarian organizations need to implement programs. So for instance, we see considerable delays in transfer of funds uh, between banks, uh, sometimes several months um, because of contractors and legislation. And we see also some, some donors adopting policies uh, which, uh, which are problematic in terms of humanitarian uh, of principal humanitarian action. So for instance, some donors ask a uh, humanitarian organization to vet beneficiaries against the counterterrorism list. So in an instance, uh, uh, an organization running an education program was asked to vet children against a list of, 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 of terrorists. Uh, we see uh, donors who pressure humanitarian organization uh, to gather intelligence uh, for counterterrorism purposes. So, for instance, explaining who they meet, when they meet, who was in the room. I mean, these are really, really uh, practical consequences. And then we see also some actors trying to use humanitarian organizations uh, for other objectives than humanitarian action. So, for instance, we see actors trying to argue that humanitarian actions needs to support the prevention of violent extremism. Uh, so, I, I give this very concrete uh, example, and we can go back to that, but just because I think that's a role of all Charles, so to build this consensus, to articulate what the problem is. And then that brings me to, to your question, Jacob, about what are the solutions and what are some of the progress we saw uh, in, in, in the past year. So the role of OCHA is really to try to, to bring together the counterterrorism community and the United community to have this dialogue and try to, 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 to find solutions together. And we've had some incremental uh, progress over the past years, including at the Security Council, uh, which adopted several resolutions acknowledging that counterterrorism legislation um, can have a, a negative impact on humanitarian operation and inviting member states to take into effect uh, this impact in the legislation. We had uh, more recently resolution 2664, uh, which basically creates a standing exemption at the Council for all UN sanctions regimes. So it's not only counterterrorism with sanctions, but it's related. You have the 1267 uh, sanctions regime, which is a counterterrorism sanctions regime under that. Uh, so, so there is progress. But what we note is that many of these um, measures are either vague, like some of the resolution calling on member states to take into effect, or they're limited in scope. That's 2664, the resolution. It applies only to asset, asset freezes while uh, counterterrorism legislations are much wider than asset freezes. They include financial regulation, criminal law, donors policies, and, and, and so on. Uh, so at the moment, what we're trying to do uh, with all China, our partners and member states and the private sector is, is really look at three, four areas where we think progress needs to be made. The first, first area is really to make sure that the legal framework uh, is, uh, is framed the right way in terms of conducive humanitarian action. So making sure that standing carve-outs are included in all counterterrorism legislation. And that's, that's the first thing we, we, we're asking for and working for with our partners. The second thing is making sure that this legal framework 
uh, at international or national level is being socialized uh, with humanitarian organizations and with private sector organizations to really explain to these actors uh, what legislation say, what is permitted, what is not permitted, uh, and really have this constructive engagement and, and finding practical solutions. And the, the, the last two areas we, we work on is uh, risk management. We're really trying to, to move with our donors in particular from a conversation on risk avoidance to a discussion on risk mitigation. We need to acknowledge that in areas where we work, there are risks in terms of counterterrorism. Um, at the same time, uh, ignoring this risk and not doing anything will, 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 will not make us progress. Uh, so we need to manage these risks uh, the proper way. And uh, one way to do that is first to acknowledge that today most humanitarian organizations have due diligence policies and risk mitigation measures in place that work pretty well. Today, to my knowledge, there's no credible report uh, that suggests that there's very systematic aid diversion to, aid diversion to the benefit of, a, of a terrorist, uh, terrorist groups. And the last area uh, we work on is really with member states here in New York to try to, to depoliticize uh, humanitarian action in the context of counterterrorism. So, for instance, we have the negotiation on the global counterterrorism strategy starting at the UN very soon. And here, the, the objective for us will be to make sure that member states acknowledge that uh, there is an issue in terms of the impact of counterterrorism on principal humanitarian action and that um, the counterterrorism strategy needs to be used to mitigate uh, the risk uh, we see. Uh, with that, over to you, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a lot that I already want to come back to in terms of, you know, to talk about consensus. Jan talked about consensus this morning, but um, having worked in Washington NGO coordination meetings, the idea of humanitarian consensus seems as, you know, a pipe dream of some sort. Um, uh, but let me turn to you, Naz. Um, uh, you've obviously been following these issues for many years. How do you see, in particular, the UN system evolving to dial back some of the most challenging elements of CT sanction regimes and other points of, of progress or challenges that remain? Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. And it's really good to be here with my old friends, Aurelien and Hisham and others. Uh, and thank you so much to the organizers, uh, particularly for allowing us to participate virtually. Uh, so, Jacob, as you said, um, this has been a, a journey of, I think, over a decade for many of us working on these issues. And so I'll try to answer your question uh, just very briefly with a few reflections. One, on kind of your question about the UN system as a whole. Uh, two, perhaps a, an unusual bright spot that Aurelien um, alluded to, this new resolution 2664. And then three, kind of some areas where at least I see big remaining questions and opportunities on the horizon in terms of the intersection between humanitarian action and CT. So first, in terms of the UN system as a whole, Jacob, I think your observation at the outset was really important that in the West, at least, and particularly in the US, we seem to be seeing a turn away from CT, almost a sense that CT as a foreign policy issue, as the global scourge against humanity, is in the rearview mirror, having been superseded by other national security threats and concerns. And I think this can almost create the impression that at the global level, that somehow is also the case. And I think, as you said, it's important to remember global CT, CT at the UN level and at the regional level, remains healthily funded. It remains a significant architecture that is seeking to expand its reach and its turf into virtually every corner of the United Nations. And in some ways, there is a question in my mind that as the states that built this architecture turn their interests away from CT, what is the strategic direction of UN counterterrorism? Who is providing that strategic direction? And is this going to be a kind of a, a massive lumbering architecture with an enormous amount of reach and funding, but without really a shared consensus around its purpose and values? Uh, two, for those of us who work in this area, I think for many years, my job was just to come to panels and say horrible, gloomy things about counterterrorism and humanitarian action. So it is indeed a distinct pleasure to say something positive. And that something positive is, as Aurelien suggested in December 2022, 
the Security Council decided Resolution 2664, creating a standing humanitarian carve out across 14 sanctions regimes, including the 1267 regime, which is um, arguably certainly the highest number of individual and entity designations, and also the key area of overlap between sanctions and counterterrorism at the Security Council. Um, my purpose is here, it's less important to get into the technicalities of the impact of the carve out on sanctions. We can talk about that in the Q&A, but rather the kind of ethos and the language we heard around the decision. So first, key states that had for years denied that the Security Council was having any adverse impact on humanitarian action through its resolutions were in the lead. Uh, key member states and Security Council member states, such as the US, indicated that they were proud to introduce a landmark resolution that will save lives. This was the kind of the, the mood at the council at the deciding of 2664. And indeed, the resolution set out its intention to clarify and preserve humanitarian activity. So what's noteworthy here is there was some language missing that we're very used to when it comes to these discussions. One, there was no reference to balancing between the values of humanitarian action and security sanctions, counterterrorism. Second, the resolution arguably does away with the kind of zero tolerance approach that Aurelien mentioned earlier, at least as to the asset freezes and at least as to the carve out with sanctions, the council appears to be embracing a pretty significant shift in its security policy that says when it comes to humanitarian action, we understand that there are going to be transfers of resources to designated individuals and entities, and we accept that risk when it comes to the narrow scope of 2664. So now what matters is interpretation and implementation, sort of how we see this resolution affecting both council implementation of the language, but also perhaps more importantly, each member state's implementation of the carve out into their domestic law and policy. Let me close with what may be on the horizon here. So one is a significant question many of us are grappling with. What are the implications of this ethos, of this possible policy shift for the counterterrorism resolutions of the Security Council? Will the underlying values of 2664, the idea that it's saving lives, the idea that it's clarifying the mess that the Security Council has arguably created for many humanitarian organizations in terms of their operations, will that result in a significant shift in CT policy and approaches to the interpretation of CT? Second, for monitoring and assessment bodies like the Financial Action Task Force, Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, how will they interpret 2664 carve out in the realm of CT? And finally, perhaps most challenging, what about domestic criminal laws that are implementing Security Council resolutions obliging all member states to create criminal legislation preventing and criminalizing the provision of resources to terrorists in light of this carve out and what I would argue is its underlying spirit. So I think a lot of opportunity this year and in the years to come, but really requiring a continued dedicated focus by um, the kinds of groups that are in this room and that have been working on this issue for so long. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I'm interested in, in this um, discrepancy you kind of laid out of a massive shift in ethos and thinking through this resolution, but also the, the UN CT architecture being in some ways a rudderless ship. Um, and I'd like to sort of maybe come back to that. But first, I want to turn to you, Rachel, and, and bring it back to the Washington perspective. Um, 
you know, especially in the context of what we heard about 2664, and, and Jan mentioned this morning in the opening, the United States went from being, he is worst to best, we'll say, among the most challenging partners on these issues to among the most constructive. Um, so we've seen this tremendous progress with respect to sanctions, but we also know that, at least on the U.S. domestic side, we have the material support for terror provision, which remains in force, and some of these underlying legal challenges remain um, even while their efforts to ease the burden on the NGOs. So can you speak a little bit to the state of play here in Washington, in particular where Congress, where this Congress and this administration are with respect to both the sanctions but also the material support for terror provision? Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for, for having me today with this great panel. Um, so, you know, this has been a very interesting space to watch over the past decade. I remember starting working on issues related to humanitarian assistance and access about you know, 13, 14 years ago when we were looking for reassurances that assistance could be provided in all Shabab controlled areas of Somalia. And the best we could get at that point was a policy statement that it was not the policy of the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control that it was not a priority for enforcement to go after humanitarian actors. So that, you know, that, that had to be enough at the time because that's all we had. Um, you know, it was interesting because that was also a time when there was a UN Security Council resolution designating Al-Shabaab where there was a UN carve out for humanitarian actors. It was one of the first ones, if not the first. Um, and, and so now we've seen kind of an evolution since that time, um, you know, there were, next, or not next, but later on, the designation of Ansarallah in Yemen, the Houthis, um, that was quickly undone um, in, I guess it was January 2020, 2021, get my dates right. Um, and that was be in large part because of a recognition of the chilling effect that a foreign terrorist organization designation has on the ability to provide humanitarian assistance in areas of greatest need. Um, and so these were kind of concrete domestic actions that set the tone that we saw have seen in this administration thus far on humanitarian assistance. Um, and that kind of threw the response and listening to the issues on the ground in Afghanistan when the Taliban took over and the delivery of humanitarian assistance became very complicated. Um, the OFAC general licenses that were issued then and the work that the US government did through the UN Security Council to create authorization specific to Afghanistan, and then last year, the um, UNSCR, UN, um, UNSCR 2664. In US domestic law, the way we've seen that UN Security Council resolution implemented is through broad general licenses across US sanctions programs, authorizing humanitarian assistance and other categories of assistance. It's really a broader list of general license authorizations than we've previously seen, including disarmament uh, DDR efforts and uh, peace building efforts, which was a, a novel addition there. Um, we've also seen um, other steps to provide reassurance to humanitarian actors, but there's still a lot of room and a lot of confusion in this space and a lot of effort to change, and there's pushback, especially in Congress, especially um, with a, a house that's skeptical at times of the benefit and utility of humanitarian assistance as against the counter-terrorist priorities and policies, and a lack of understanding about what it is necessary to provide assistance on the ground. Um, and so these are the areas now where I see the greatest need and the greatest work going forward. Um, and I think part of this is identifying, okay, so we have the U.S. implementation of UNSCR 2664 through these UN general, um, these, through these OFAC general licenses. That's the way the U.S. has done it. Other countries are doing it differently, so we're already getting to a patchwork of local laws. But looking at the U.S. example, just as, as one specific example of all the complexities here, the way that the authorizations have been implemented are through the sanctions program. So that's under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, the IEPA statute, which is the basis for most US sanctions. But as Naz mentioned, it's not the only legal authority in play here. So there's the material support statute, which is the criminal prohibition on the provision of material support or resources to 
foreign terrorist organizations, which does not have these sorts of exemptions. Um, and that is a glaring hole in the nature of the authorizations that the U.S. can provide, even where the U.S. government has been providing policy reassurances on that front. There are also export controls, which are implemented under a variety of domestic U.S. laws. Um, you know, most notably recently are export controls that prohibit exports to Syria. Um, and we saw the real impact that these export controls have had on the ability to quickly and effectively provide a humanitarian response to the earthquake because it creates an additional lag time that requires review and authorization by the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security before items can be exported or re-exported into Syria to provide this humanitarian response. And so this is just an example of kind of the broad array of laws that we need to deal with so that organizations can effectively operate on the ground. And so I think as a next step, I would love for the, the laws and the policies and the um, very clear guidance to evolve such that I don't have a job anymore. Um, so that it's very clear to organizations that as a policy matter, you know, the, the donors like the US government, like the EU and, and the UK and, and UN have decided it is in our policy it is in our it is to the benefit to, to the world our greater you know foreign policy to provide humanitarian assistance in these situations so then taking a perspective from the ground speaking to the actors who need to implement that assistance and really take stock identify all the remaining roadblocks that are there because there are many and then meticulously and effectively chip away at them so that resources can go to those in need while preventing and mitigating the risk of diversion to terrorists, but in a way that's not going to serve as a roadblock to humanitarian assistance going forward. Thanks. Um, there's so, so many follow-up questions, um, so we'll just have to pick a couple. I'm gonna come back to you, Hisham, and, and ask you two questions to respond to some of the comments from our, from our colleagues. The first is, in your engagement with your donors, have you seen evidence of the um, mental shift that Nas spoke about, um, a move away from zero tolerance and a move away from this balancing narrative? Or is that, is that still yet to filter from that level at the UN Security Council to your day-to-day -day negotiation about your partnerships? And then what you mentioned about um, the domestic governments. I mean, this panel, I think, is very much thinking about donors and, and, and the regulations at that level, but this is a huge problem. Um, states that have, have either modeled their domestic legal frameworks on those that, that, you know, the United States or the Europeans or those that were kind of pushed out by the UN um, special agencies, um, it's very easy to create a lot of restriction and it's really hard to unwind them. Um, so have you had dialogue with some of those governments, not about your ability to negotiate with the armed groups, but about their own legal frameworks and the challenges they present? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, on the, on the first question, um, I think it, it's linked to what my colleagues were saying. Uh, I mean, you have these positive steps that were taken with this resolution, but the implementation is, of course, taking time. And the diffusion of it, just even the awareness of it. I mean, when I, I would go a lot, I was in Brussels a couple of, of weeks ago, um, and even for them, you know, it's still foreign. So there is still delays, there are still delays, there are still a lack of full understanding of, of what they can do now, what they can do and how they can basically uh, allow, uh, let's say, organizations, you know, to engage with these groups and funding can be done, uh, can be pro provided without any, any risk. Um, so we still have these delays, how we mitigate them by ourselves, I mean, and our CEO, of course, and other colleagues, continuing to educate. And it's not because we have a resolution that, that was, you know, uh, uh, adopted uh, in New York that automatically in Brussels and elsewhere, and at the local powers, you know, in, in Stockholm, in Bern, that automatically there is an understanding. So there is still um, a huge need of uh, advocacy, I would say bilateral advocacy, but as well in panels or, or, or in forums, because we still see some, some reluctance. And as well, 
from the private uh, world, and I think Aurélien I think, alluded to that, I mean, the banking systems. Uh, banks are <laughs> so afraid. I mean, I can tell you, and Swiss banks, they're not known for their openness and transparency. I can tell you how difficult it is to make them accept um, that we use them to channel money. I mean, it's, uh, it's our biggest, biggest, biggest nightmare. And I say Geneva Call, but I, can, I think I can speak on behalf of other organizations. Um, Afghanistan is almost impossible. I mean, we have to bring cash. Uh, myself, I had to go to Libya with cash, a lot of cash, just to go and uh, pay our staff and try to provide, you know, our humanitarian assistance. Because banks are saying no. We are not going to take this risk. And I can tell you, they don't really care about resolution uh, uh, 2664 or whatever. They have their own, let's say, uh, risk, uh, risk assessment. So we need to embark with us as well uh, the, the private systems, uh, the private, let's say, world, and especially the, the, the banks. This is for us a big challenge. Um, on the local states, it's very interesting because I can give two examples, one uh, in the Sahel region, one with Mali and one with Burkina Faso. With Mali, we, since, of course, the coup d'etat and, let's say, the um, stronger, let's say, positioning of the current government, which is a military government, uh, I was in Mali, I think, uh, last month, um, everyone from the, direct, the cabinet directors to the deputy ministers, ministers, they're all colonels. So they come from the military. So I can tell you they don't know a thing about what we'll be discussing right now. So it's extremely difficult. Uh, they would not even understand. Uh, however, Burkina Faso, still we have a coup d'etat, still we have you know, military in place. But we've been, uh, we've been engaging with them uh, since uh, I mean, uh, early on. And there, have been, and there were some positive discussions and understanding about the fact that they should allow, you know, uh, um, let's say, organizations to, to, uh, to speak with the, with the armed groups. And why here? Because there is an understanding that this is one of the only ways to uh, reach sustainable peace. I think it's really different how the, the host government is positioning itself. If it's coming from the only so solution is to crush armed groups, uh, because they are all enemies, then it's very hard to discuss with. If we have a government that understand that it's not a solution because it does not work, and they saw examples like the US in Afghanistan, I mean, you have a mighty power with an alliance of I don't know how many countries that had to run from uh, guys in flip-flops and Kalashnikov in their hands. So they see that maybe it's not the solution. So one solution could be discussing, talking. And if they can't, maybe other, other can, like Geneva Call or other organizations. So it's really at what stage the government is in their thinking. Uh, I think when they failed only military options, this is where basically they, they are more comfortable into, let's say, allowing, uh, let's say, armed organizations talking to, uh, to armed groups. And I want as well to finish by, we have the responsibility, the organizations, to show impact and quick impact. We just cannot say, give us access, give us access, but for what? And then years after years, we don't, we don't show things. I think this is very important because there is a strong perception from armed groups, from the states, that we are not in the country for the things that we've been saying we, we've been doing. There is a lot of, I can tell you, um, allegations, and this has been I've been, you know, told directly by host governments, by armed groups leaders, that you guys are here for uh, spying on us. You are working with, uh, with, with the West against us. This exists. I mean, I can tell you, it's not just paranoia. It exists, I've been told. So we have as well to come and show concrete, concrete and clear impact for populations to basically uh, counter this, this narrative. Yeah. Thanks, thank you. And, and thank you for raising uh, the question of impact. You're talking about the impact of your operations, but I want to turn to you, Naz, and talk about um, the impact of the sanctions. I mean, one of the, especially in Washington, you get the, the question like, well, what's, 
what haven't you done? How has it been, like, what has been impacted negatively? And it, oftentimes you end up trying to prove a counterfactual. You're trying to make a, a quantitative assessment of stuff that didn't happen. And so I'm curious, um, from your perspective, um, what is the importance of having good data on the impact? And, um, you know, having observed the process in New York, I mean, how much of it was a data-driven argument and how much of it was, uh, you know, a narrative or, or kind of a higher level argument where the data was an important piece of it, but it wasn't driven by that kind of hard number crunching. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. It's a hugely important and difficult question. So I, my impression is that in New York, it, was, it depends, I think, how we define data. So I think if you include qualitative uh, testimonies from the field, evidence from interviews, structured interviews, then certainly the amount of research and advocacy and information gathering that's been carried out by groups like NRC, Interaction, OCHA, and others was crucial. Um, I think if we mean data in terms of real quantitative data of impact, and this idea throughout the years that many, um, many member states in the context of CT have said, you know, well, we want to know exactly how many people are losing their lives because of CT regulation, or we want to know exactly how many convoys are not getting through because of CT regulation. Uh, I advise humanitarian organizations to push back on this request. I, I think on a few grounds. One is that causal link, the idea that a counterterrorism resolution at the Security Council could be directly linked in some satisfactory statistical manner to humanitarian outcomes is is not an ask that you can deliver on for a variety of reasons it doesn't mean there is no impact it just means that that's not that's not a challenge a humanitarian organization should accept in my view but second and much more importantly um it is asking humanitarian organizations in many jurisdictions and in many contexts not least of which the u.s to document their violation of criminal laws. So you, you cannot undertake a quantitative assessment of impact in a meaningful manner, certainly not in an academically or statistically uh, meaningful manner, in a context in which part of the impact is that the organizations need to be able to document uh, activities which could be seen as criminal under overbroad legislation in a variety of jurisdictions. So I think data matters, evidence certainly matters. You wanna have evidence inform policy making, but I think it's crucial for humanitarian actors to be clear about the limits, both on what can be identified through research. And second, to be clear about the unacceptable risks that would be posed to humanitarian actors seeking to quote, prove that impact and put it back on the donors, put it back on the member states. You know, if you are the ones providing funding for humanitarian action, then it is your responsibility to ensure that that is being done in an efficient and effective manner. But I think um, it, is, it is difficult and in some cases bordering on impossible to provide quantitative data of impact in a manner that can be seen as directly causal. Thanks. I'm, I'm reminded of the, uh, from the wire, you know, Stringer Bell, you don't take notes on a criminal conspiracy, right? Asking people to document their own violations seems like a bit unfair. So maybe like, let's, let's just stay with OCHA then and, and come back to you, Aurelia. Um, you know, as a, as a coordinating mechanism, how do you at OCHA track the impact of the CT measures? Um, you know, what OCHA has access challenges, you know, tracking methodologies. So how do you think about tracking this impact um, given that role of coordination and, and that somewhat removed from uh, the NGO day-to-day -day experience? That, thanks. I mean, it, it, it's complicated because um, as Rachel and, um, and Nas suggested, uh, in any context you have a web of legislation, resolution, counterterrorism, uh, legislations, uh, sanctions regime that apply. And very often uh, what member states want to know is what is the concrete impact of one particular measure. This is almost impossible uh, to, to entangle. And we see it right now in the context of uh, Syria, uh, the Syria earthquake response. 
Um, so that's why a bit building on what Nas said, we've been very careful not to fall too much in that trap, to put it this way, of like constantly arguing on, on what is and, and and stay at the level of saying, look, this web creates very concrete, this web of measures creates very concrete hurdles and we need to address it together and 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 and, and build this uh, advocacy on with, with very powerful examples and telling uh, and telling examples. So and that has worked to some extent and and, and, and it has really contributed to changing um, the discussion between uh, humanitarians, member states, and counterterrorism, uh, counterterrorism actors. Having said that, having worked a lot on the Afghanistan exemption, but also on 2664 uh, resolution, uh, what made the real difference and what, what really triggered the policy uh, shift Rachel, Rachel described is a political dynamic. Uh, let's not be naive about that. It's uh, sanctions in particular have become a very contentious issue between member states of the UN. Uh, and uh, there was a, a willingness from some states to show that uh, their sanctions were not the reasons for humanitarian issues in particular crisis. Uh, so that's really what uh, in Afghanistan, but also uh, in other in other places, so that's really one of the key elements. In other words, you can have the data, data the best data uh, possible, and we should uh, give data, uh, but it's not enough. You need to to have some political will, and and in this case, the the, the starter line. Uh, just maybe um, one or two um, side comments to say that. Um, we will have to see in the coming month uh, if uh, what applies to sanctions will be translated in the in the counterterrorism agenda of the UN. And I'm saying that because there's not many areas of consensus right now at the UN between member states, uh, as you can imagine. But one area of consensus is actually that they need to fight terrorism, and that member states at national level needs to have the latitude to do it the way they see best fit. So we really need to see whether. This will be uh, confirmed. And one last remark said that one flip side I want to flag of this uh, incremental progress is that uh, measures taken by the Security Council and member states also come with obligation for, you, for, for, for humanitarian organizations. The obligation to show impact uh, of humanitarian programs, but also of, uh, of exemptions, uh, but also obligations to, to report more and more uh, on uh, on, on different aspects of around aid diversion, due diligence policies uh, to, to, to member states. And we need to make, and that's perfectly normal and perfectly okay, but we need to make sure that that doesn't become a way to control humanitarian actions by, by political actors. Over to you. Thanks. Um, Rachel, coming back to you, I have um, two questions. They may be connected, um, but I'll ask them both and do as you see fit. And then maybe we can open up for a question or two from our esteemed audience here. The first is, um, going back to this, this um, 2664 and the efforts there, I mean, you've written on this issue, you've advised the humanitarians. Um, were there elements, and, and you come from working in government, so you've been on the other side of this. Um, are there pieces of the advocacy and policy discussion that um, led to this humanitarian exemption that can be applied to the stickier challenge of the material support for terror provision in the United States? And we have seen now um, some sort of bipartisan consensus on um, the AUMFs, the authorizations for the use of military force. Um, there's real discussion about what the United States is doing in Somalia and Syria. And I'm wondering if those discussions also create some space for a broader conversation about the negative impacts of this war footing, this counterterrorism framework um, as, as a way to see the world. Good questions, um, and I'll take the last first from a very broad lens without specifically delving into the AUMF. I mean, I think, you know, what this is really showing us is, you know, this is a great time for taking stock, right? We've been in the midst of this war on terror since we were both in college, um, and, you know, we are two decades, 20 years later now. Um, and so the question is, you know, so there were a number of tools that were, that came into being in that era, um, and the AUMF among them, 
And so, I, you know, without saying any specific outcome is the right outcome, it's time to take a step back to look at all of the tools in our counterterrorism arsenal in the context of the very necessary humanitarian needs around the world, and not just humanitarian, but broader needs for development assistance. You know, very, there's not agreement necessarily on what constitutes humanitarian assistance. And I'm not saying we need to define it, but I'm saying we need flexibility to, on the one hand, prioritize development and assistance while accounting for the counterterrorism posture we're in. So you know, that's kind of a, the guiding light, the principle that I think should be informing these policy decisions, which should be happening. And then in terms of the concrete steps to um, create the necessary carve-outs to, for example, the material support statute, what I've observed um, in the time I've been working on these issues is a very concerted effort by those in the um, international community, the international NGO community, who are on the ground in these environments that are quite challenging to work in, engaging with each other and with those who are making the policies, making the decisions to identify first among themselves, okay, what are the issues? What are the roadblocks we're facing? How can we come up with authorizations that would avoid those roadblocks? And then presenting those solutions to the policymakers so that they can then implement them. Um, you know, that's identifying the categories of assistance to authorize, the mechanisms through which to authorize it, whether it be OFAC general licenses or in the material support statute context, a statutory change, or perhaps in the interim, some greater clarity from the executive branch on how specific terms will be applied and defined at least to provide reassurance to those on the ground what is and is not allowed, drawing more bright line rules, because when we do not have clear guidance, there is a chilling effect on implementation of assistance. Thanks. So we have, uh, the system works, so if you want to send in questions, I have a little iPad here. We have a, a first question from a Joel Charney. Um, uh, I mean, let, let's get into like brass tacks here, right? Like, it's the Patriot Act. And do you think that there's any possibility, political or practical, to, to get an amendment or, or an otherwise legislative solution to the material support for terror? I, I won't say never. You know, seeing the evolution from the, um, with the general licenses that we've seen, you know, from the time in 2010 when this issue first became discussed to now, Nobody thought we were going to see these broad general licenses across programs. Granted, that's an executive action, not a congressional action. Um, but I, I wouldn't say never. And I think the key is really honing in on what is the issue we are trying to solve, defining it specifically and concretely, and identifying a specific solution to it. So it's not saying that we want to allow diversion to terrorists. That's nobody's goal. We want to prevent assistance from being diverted to terrorists, but we want to do it in a way that allows the organizations that have been tasked and mandated to provide that assistance to carry out their jobs using the congressionally appropriated funds oftentimes to do it. And so again, I think specific definitions might, might help get over some roadblocks in Congress, but who knows, it's, it's a long game. Yeah, you think about the example that Hashem raised of carrying bags of cash. I mean, from, a, from an accounting and a tracking of um, donor funds, you know, it's, it's the, the bitter irony is they've, these, these regulations have created uh, methodologies to get around them that fundamentally undermine the intent of the regulations. Um, and it makes it a very complex uh, uh, issue to handle. Um, any more questions from, from the audience before we turn back to our panelists for some, for some final thoughts? Feel free, don't be shy. Okay, great. Um, while we wait, you can also send them in. I have the iPad here. Um, let, me, let me maybe come back to you, um, Naz. I mean, uh, like, perhaps the same question I put to, to Rachel here in your crystal ball. Um, uh, you know, and it's, it's the way that you describe this shift in terms of um, the loss of the language of balancing the interests and that shift away from zero tolerance. I mean, I can remember writing my own NGO reports where you sort of, it was almost like control A, you put that sentence in at the beginning and then you like moved on to what you wanted to say. Um, you know, what, what can we expect to see in the future? Are there, are there um, 
things down the pipeline that we should be looking at to focus our efforts. We had a conversation this morning about advocacy around access. You know, where, where are, in a limited community, right, the humanitarian community of advocacy is quite small. So where should efforts be focused? Um, where are the best opportunities that have the maximum impact? Yeah, that's a great question. And and I think, you know, just building on what Rachel said, but connecting that with something Aurelian said at the beginning, of course, the really tricky thing about this advocacy is it's a, true that no humanitarian organization would say our goal is to provide support to terrorists. It is also true that one, 2664 does envision the possibility of transfers of resources in narrow and particular context. And second, of course, in some areas like medical care, it is part of humanitarian activity to provide medical care to all wounded and sick in armed conflict, including those who might be designated as terrorists. So the advocacy is extra hard here because it's often not as simple as just saying, of course, nobody wants to provide any sort of assistance to anyone who might be designated as terrorists. Um, second, your question is a very particular one. In a limited uh, number of advocates and people who, who have the resources to be focused on advocacy, and in a world of many ways in which this problem manifests, I, at this moment, would not advise focusing on the material support statute in the United States. Of course, Rachel is right that we can't predict, but my crystal ball does not see um, drastic change from Congress to the material support statute anytime soon. I would focus more on advocacy related to further implementation by the executive branch of 2664 expanding into CT and perhaps equally importantly, ensuring that CT implementation in a number of other jurisdictions, so host countries, but also other donors reflects the perhaps new ethos. And finally, as Hisham said, private sector, private sector, private sector. How do you take these changes and ensure that governments are actually communicating to banks and other entities that there is an expanded range of conduct that can be engaged in by the private sector, which would not expose them to liability? Um, I think that is where I would focus limited resources uh, and be realistic about what looks like it could at least shift or start to change, as opposed to those areas where, of course, we would like to see changes, but where we may not see the political possibility uh, in the U.S. right now. Thanks. We do have a, a question up front here. So if one of our friends with the mic can, can reach you, if not, you can just ask the question and I'll repeat it for our, our online audience. And if you could introduce yourself as well, please. Hello. Okay, this works. Um, hi, my name is Leticia Dietezwa. I'm a contractor for the Department of State. Um, I particularly had a question to follow up on your questions about maximum efforts. In the previous discussions we've heard throughout the morning, there have been both an emphasis on a need for advocacy, but also on a need to understand the limitations um, of the extraneous efforts being put on local actors, particularly what they're able to do and what they're not able to do. So my question for, excuse me, the group at large is how to move forward on the need for advocacy as well as engagement in diplomacy while balancing the um, extended risks that that may put on local actors and implementers who may both have to lead this efforts of advocacy whilst also doing some work in these hard to reach areas where they're, they are dealing with actors who perhaps view them both as enemies and as well trying to balance their roles, excuse me, perhaps being representatives of larger groups that they may, that may not necessarily have the best reputation with those actors on the ground. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Maybe we can um, start um, on the screen with you, Aurelian. Um, yeah, some thoughts about but the, the limitations of advocacy and the potential impact this kind of advocacy and work on this issue might have on the local actors who have become, you know, uh, central to the discussion about shifting the balance of humanitarian work. Look, on, on advocacy and humanitarian diplomacy, I think it, it's fair to say that it's been fairly successful over the past years. I mean, I've been following this issue for quite a while, and we're definitely uh, in a better place today than where we were 10 years ago, I, th 
I think one thing we should do as humanitarians uh, is also recognize the constraints um, member states and government and political actors are, are, are under. I mean, if I take the example of the US, with an extremely difficult uh, history with terrorism, I'm French, it's the same. And for any government to come back on some of the legislation uh, that have been enacted or to amend them, uh, it's complicated with the public opinion. And, and, and we need to, to, to recognize that and we need to work with them uh, to, to, to manage uh, some of the risks uh, they're creating by, by, by giving space to humanitarians, to be, uh, to, to, to be honest. So, so I think that needs to be part of our advocacy. Second, on, on local actors and risks, I mean, I've come back to, to, to what I said at the, um, at the beginning. We need to be very specific about what we need in terms of space and be very specific about how we're managing risks and which due diligence policies we're putting in place. And here, uh, it's not like adopting carve-outs is opening the floodgates. Um, preventing aid diversion, ensuring that humanitarian assistance goes to the most uh, vulnerable. It's not only a, an issue of terrorism from a humanitarian perspective, it's our mandate, it's our mission. So we need to do that. And we, we, when we work with the local actors, I mean, it's true, some of the capacity might be uh, less than international organization, but it's not like we're providing assistance without, without any control or without looking at what's going on. Uh, and today, there's not been uh, a lot of, uh, of systemic, systemic uh, aid uh, diversion. For, Lou, for for us, in terms of advocacy, it's important we explain what is in place and how we mitigate some of the some of the some of the risk, and how also we work with some local actors to help them reinforce their own system and how we control our partners, including local organisations, to avoid uh, aid uh, aid diversion. And I would end by saying that. We need to realize that we invest together between humanitarian actors and counterterrorism actors, and that we need to have this dialogue like today, we need to have this engagement, and we need to include private sector uh, partners in that. That's the only way we'll be able to, to, to make sure that member states can continue to fight terrorism the way they want. That's not really my job, uh, but also do it in a way that respects international humanitarian law and respect humanitarian space and the capacity of organization to, to, to operate on the ground. Over to you. Thanks. Um, Naz, any thoughts on that final question or any final thoughts you wish to share? Uh, just to uh, just definitely supporting everything Aurelien just said, and and also to add that I think it's <laughs> Jacob. I think you said at the beginning that a consensus is hard to build in all kinds of places, but also within the humanitarian community. Um, and I think here there can definitely be effective labor sharing between local organizations and international NGOs, and then of course UN humanitarian agencies in terms of who takes the bulk of the work of dealing with this issue and in some ways how you might even provide sort of cover for local implementing partners and also local organizations. But I think the question uh, is, it, it can't be dealt with purely by this answer, right? The, the question really speaks to some of the underlying political challenges that organi local organizations face um, that it are not easily addressed by due diligence or by compliance practices or by, by any of these issues, but rather really go back to the question of local CT and other measures that create very, very real risks for local organizations. Thanks. Thanks. And turning to the stage, um, Hashem, do you have any, any final thoughts or want to respond to that question as well? Thank you very much. No, yeah, just on to, um on the risk on local actors. Um, these risks are increasing because we see a transfer from the global discussion to uh, the local, let's say, uh, governments that are now you know, being more assertive and putting more restrictions. So definitely the, the people that are greater at risk are the ones on the ground. And here, one way as well is um, to better equip them with the knowledge and the fact that what they do is legal. And I think it's important, and Jan spoke about that uh, earlier enough, the capacity um, building that is done, but it's mostly for inter international organizations. I mean, with uh, 
CCHN and others have been myself and panels trying to explain to uh, UN principles. Uh, it's great, but who is taking care about you know, the local organizations? Who is capacitating them as well, giving them the knowledge, giving them the reassurance? And the re you are reassured when you know that what you do is legal. And I think it's very important. So, and when we speak about local, for those of you here that have been working in the field, um, we don't speak about the local NGOs that are located in, in the capitals. Uh, mostly, unfortunately, they are very close to the regime. But the ones that are really out there, the community-based organizations, uh, the grassroots actors, the traditional leaders, um, forms of organizations in the field um, is not what we see. They are not, you know, perfectly you know, formalized and organized, but they are the ones acting on the ground, um, women association, youth. So how we can better make sure to accompany them as well into their actions, giving them the security by providing them with the information and being there as well when uh, they may face you know, some uh, legal um, or administrative issues. So this is on the on this, um, on the point on advocacy, and I just want maybe to finish on um, three percent labeling matters. Uh, labeling armed groups by being terrorist. Uh, if you are a state, at the end of the day, that's fine. You know, when organizations are using this label, this for me is an issue um, because we know that we don't want to politicize aid, but by labeling them this way, you are politicizing already uh, the aid because you are putting them in the political box. Uh, terrorism, is, there's, there's no legal definition. It's a political definition. So I think we have to refrain, and I speak we, the uh, humanitarian organizations as a whole, to use political labeling uh, when we communicate, when we have bilateral discussion with states, um, because this, of course, is not neutral. I mean, it comes with, uh, with a price. Uh, this is the first point. And my last point, if we look forward, um, <clears throat> we've been dealing with city measures and consequences uh, because we've been facing uh, radical Islamist groups. I mean, let's, uh, let's be honest, in the past 15 years, uh, these measures come, came really harsh because we've been working in, you know, in the Middle East, uh, in Afghanistan, and so on and so, on and so forth. But what um, the, few, the new conflicts may not be in this region, will be potentially in, the, in, in Asia, uh, around the Chinese Sea and other countries. So, we have as well to maybe anticipate uh, what will be the sanctions that will be posed when we have to come and deliver uh, uh, need, needed aid. And my, my fear, uh, it will come, I think, from the states. I mean, the, the assertiveness of states will be increasing, the states that are the regional level. Regional actors will be as well much more involved, BRICS as well will have a bigger role to play. So we have as well to compose with that and have a particular answer to it, but just maybe a food for thought uh, to anticipate what will come in the next uh, decade. So thank you very much. Thank you, and Rachel, some final thoughts um, in response to the comments or the question or anything you wish to share with our audience before we close. Great, um, great. And, and I think Hisham, what you're describing is really kind of as, as Jacob started things off, the geopolitical shift that we've seen where you know, the focus is not just terrorism, but there are many other geopolitical issues that are here and are on the horizon that will impact uh, risk profiles for, for everyone. Um, but, but going back to the question and to kind of the point of the local actors on the ground, um, you know, the importance of empowering and educating those who are on the front lines of assistance is critical. It also goes the other way because these are the actors who are on the ground, who are closest to the delivery of assistance. And it's so important for their experiences and the actual implementation challenges that they face to make it back along the line of those who are the, um, you know, the prime grantees, back to the grantors, the donors, so that there can be truly informed policy making in this space. So even though you know, we're not going to get specific and clear numbers or anything like that, and as Naz wisely recommended, we should not be collecting them, um, 
or at least the organizations operating on the ground should not be. Um, identifying the very real challenges that are faced then allows the policymakers to figure out how to effectively overcome them. Whether it's material support statute, if that's not happening anytime soon, there are other tools of foreign policy, defining regulations, coming out with policy guidance, coming out with additional licenses and authorizations, tackling export controls, which are a real barrier. So the first step is identifying the challenges on the ground, and that's where communication is key, both from the local actors to the folks that they are working with interim in the chain, among laterally organizations that are providing assistance, and also with the government donors. Thank you so much. So um, a ton of content. Um, one issue that we didn't really get into um, that you mentioned, but we didn't have a chance to interrogate. We'll have a session tomorrow about um, sanctions and financial access, and I'm going to put in a plug for some of CSAS's own work. We put out a report a few months back um, specifically on financial access and um, the importance of dialogue between all the component parts of the humanitarian sister, the system, the UN, the NGOs, the banks, the commercial providers, and of course the government's um, donors and, and otherwise. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to come back and, and watch that panel tomorrow. Um, for today, let me just say thank you to um, Rachel Alpert, Hisham Khadarui, um, Nazma Zirzadeh, and Aurelia Mbufle for joining us. And also, um, just a thank you, on, I think, on behalf of the humanitarian community for all of your work uh, in support of both um, the civilians in need, but also helping unpack and, and tackle some of these complex legal and, and regulatory challenges. Um, for folks in the room, we have lunch, um, and we invite you to join us. And we'll come back for our afternoon sessions at 1 PM. Thank you so much. Thank you.